Thank you very much for being here this morning. I'm very honored to host this first panel. And we are going to have time for questions at the end of the panel, but I wanted to set the stage a little bit. Our panel today is called, officially, uh, Range Management and Airspace to Orbital Integration. And the reason why this is important is because space starts on the ground. We do not achieve an orbital and sustainable orbital environment without having the right policies on the ground and the right procedures to ensure that we have free and unfettered access to space. But when I say free and unfettered access to space, it needs to be done in a way that is safe, that protects uh, other operators, other users of the airspace, and people on the ground. This panel can address that, and we have a, a collection of experts that I'm very honored to be uh, moderating for them and to present today. So I will start by introducing all of our experts, and then we'll do the presentations one by one. We will have questions at the end. So I appreciate your patience in saving your questions and your enthusiasm for having questions for each of these expert panelists. My first panelist is Devin Dickens. He is an expert in range management. He has 16 years experience in aerospace with Millennium Engineering and integration programs in compact modernized telemetry processes. He works for the SLS program, the space data integrator for FAA, and he has prior experience with the Eastern Range launch team working on the shuttle, Atlas, Delta, and SpaceX rockets. Our next expert comes to us from Germany, Sven Kaltenhauser from the DLR Institute of Flight Guidance. He is an expert on ATM validation and real-time simulation and has led multiple national and international research campaigns. He represents DLR at the FAA Center of Excellence for Commercial Space, the European Commercial Spaceport Forum, and the European Group on Suborbital Flight Regulation. He is an expert on high altitude operations and the integration of space vehicle operations into the air traffic management systems. And finally, Carissa Robinson. She works for Mosaic ATM, where she is a principal analyst and systems engineer supporting NASA, FAA, and DOD. She works in air traffic management, human space exploration, and satellite technology. Carissa started in the space field by training astronauts and cosmonauts bound for the ISS and the flight controllers at the Johnson Space Center. I'd like to welcome all three of our panelists. So in terms of logistics, your clicker is right here, and I will turn this over to Devin. Hello, everyone. I'm not sure if uh, you can hear me OK. I, I want to thank uh, the I, uh, AA, uh, the University of Texas, and, and all of you for coming to this conference. Uh, thank you to Dr. Howard and Dr. Ja um, for, for all of your work over the years and for putting on this uh, conference and allowing me to come in and, and speak with you. Um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, Elvis. Elvis is an algorithm. Uh, we did have a little bit of fun with the title, as you can see. Um, so, oh, and apparently I'm hitting the wrong button. So for myself, as a 10-year-old, uh, I had a vision of the future of, of what it could be. It included things normal 10-year-olds love, jetpacks. Uh, this is an image of, of Jetman uh, completing a historic flight, I believe, uh, last week. Um, flying cars, uh, something that, that Uber is desperately trying to, to help me uh, get from point A to point B. F space stations, and then, of course, point-to-point uh, -point suborbital transport, although 10-year-old me didn't really call it that. I just called it really fast planes. So thinking about those things, how do we make that become a reality? Uh, with point-to-point -point suborbital transportation, there's been a building block for commercial space transportation. The introduction of commercial vertical launchers, uh, SpaceX Falcon 9, Rocket Lab, uh, their Electron rocket and others, and then uh, commercial ballistic reentry vehicles. The capsules coming back from the space station in both Cygnus and Dragon, uh, and also the CST-100 Starliner. And those have also led to the introduction of commercial gliding reentry vehicles, uh, specifically Sierra Nevada's Dream Chaser, uh, the Spaceship Company's Spaceship Two, uh, and, and there are several others still in development. In order to help these commercial operators get there, the federal government and existing infrastructure for the space industry has provided them insight and guidance into several different areas. You can see there's uh, licensing support, um, mission planning, 
uh, range integration, getting them involved in the federal ranges and then eventually into the commercial spaceports, making them all follow a standardized process. Uh, with industrial safety, where should propellants be located? Uh, how far apart uh, do operations need to be with neighboring operations? Uh, personnel distance recovery. Uh, then flight safety analysis. Flight safety analysis uh, really looks at several different elements. Uh, but to start all that, first we need to look at the current airspace system. You can see here, pictured here, this is the national airspace system in the United States. Pictured as just the contiguous U.S. But you have 24 million square miles of oceanic airspace and 5 million square miles of uh, domestic airspace. All of that being managed. At any one point, there's probably about a 5,000 aircraft in the air, all trying to get from point A to point B. And now we have to route uh, spacecraft through that airspace at the same time. So how do we do this? Separation is the key to, to handling it in the current regime uh, through temporary flight restrictions, special use airspace, aircraft hazard areas. You define uh, a spacecraft's trajectory, determining the vehicle flight characteristics, uh, a debris catalog of how that vehicle might break up. You're able to determine the struck lines that that vehicle will stay within. And therefore, the, the thought is that you can create your temporary flight restrictions and aircraft hazard areas based on that information. So to do this safety risk analysis, uh, there are three uh, portions of it, three parts to it. You have public protection, ship protection, and aircraft protection. The public protection is both personnel and property. And it's calculated by first considering the probability of impact. The probability of impact uh, is based on several different uh, characteristics, specifically flight dynamics. Uh, how is the, the vehicle put together? What is the fragment and debris model of that vehicle? Um, what is the performance of that vehicle? Where is it going to be going? And then a failure rate at each phase of flight. Then there are also external factors, uh, known atmospheric conditions ahead of time. What are the types of atmosphere, uh, known wind profiles that you're going to be experiencing? Uh, and then, of course, the atmospheric uncertainty on day of, of operation. Um, and then, of course, you have sensor bias as well, depending on what instrumentation you have coming in. All of that will be then used to calculate the probability of impact of any one of those pieces and of fragments. Derived from that piece of I is your expected casualties. It's done by looking at the count of the population for a given area, uh, it's looked at uh, with sheltering models. Are personnel in hardened concrete structures? Um, are they in primitive structures or prefabricated homes? F, with that information, you can then determine uh, the expectation of casualties. Uh, it is important to note that for space operations, the expectation of casualties includes more than fatalities. It also includes serious injuries as well. With gliding reentry vehicles, it creates a different problem space. For ballistic reentries, it's fairly uh, simplistic to, to calculate the known trajectory of that ballistic object. A rock falling is going to fall like a rock. You can determine where that trajectory is going to be, where the impact point, the instantaneous impact point of that debris, as that capsule reenters orbit. With gliding reentry vehicles, you have a massive cross range. Uh, you can see here, these are different trajectories of uh, re-entering spacecraft. This is actually from Space Shuttle um, landing at Kennedy Space Center. Trying to calculate all the potential variations of all of those points uh, is, is incredibly daunting and statistically almost impossible unless you have a, a supercomputer or a cluster and hours and hours and hours of time to do the calculations. With gliding reentry vehicles, you also have other issues. Uh, energy management is uh, used by those systems on reentry. Their guidance and navigation computers look at that energy management um, to bleed as much energy as possible uh, upon reentry. Um, you also take into account the atmospheric conditions, even solar winds as part of that before uh, reentering the atmosphere. There are different uh, ways to calculate this issue, and then to determine the failure modes for that craft as it's coming in. You have, of course, on-course on intact impact, 
uh, on course midair breakup, those are two of the most common. But then you also have your turn and breakup model. With a gliding reentry vehicle, the air forces on that vehicle can cause a, a turn, uh, and that breakup would cause a dispersion that would be hard to predict. If you take, take a look at that and try with a brute force Monte Carlo method for statistical analysis, it's going to take hours and hours, if not days, uh, and it's simply too long to determine. So looking at what this actually looks like, uh, you can see an image on the right of a re-entry vehicle uh, re-entering at, at uh, Kennedy's uh, runway 15 at the shuttle landing facility. And you have this, this view of a fanned out approach. As the vehicle comes in, those are the possible different uh, turn uh, areas and where the debris might go, uh, overlaid on top of a map of the state with a population density pictured in the uh, orange and yellow. So this itself is a visualization of what that probability of impact and expected casualties can be. These are the decisions that federal regulators need to look at to, to make to determine if a reentry can be licensed properly and can be conducted uh, appropriately and safely. The other element to this, after public protection, is ship protection. So taking a look at different vessels, maritime vessels that might be in the area, might be in the water, uh, you have very target geometries, um, hole penetration thresholds. If the kinetic energy of a fragment is equal to the hole threshold, that ship is going to be lost and, and sink and, and considered all lives, uh, all souls are on board that ship will be lost. And that will then go into the calculation for expected casualties ahead of time. The third regime of aircraft protection looks at a different method. Um, the primary method for doing this now is to look at time bounded with an area over a specific aircraft. Um, pictured here on the right is a Boeing 747 as an aircraft considering its population and size and the length of time it will be in the area as compared to a landing again at, at KSC 15. This is being done at, at 1e to the minus 7 or uh, 1 in 10 million uh, as the expected casualty threshold. And you create this image on the right the red box is the debris contour of the vehicle. The blue box is then the hazard area that gets transmitted uh, into a, a NOTAM, a notice to airmen. And that is how uh, some of those boxes are then generated. So all of this works great pre-mission. Elvis is a new way of looking at this problem space. Um, instead of using the, the previous method, we look at a swept area of the target aircraft as a function of the cruising velocity of the target aircraft. Uh, this is versus taking the, the, the allocating that, that aircraft geometry fractionally over a, a specific cell. The idea is that you take an aircraft and you spread it over the area, uh, considering that aircraft can be in larger places at once. That is the, the current regime. With Elvis, you actually look at the cruising altitude, cruising velocity of, an, of a vehicle as it's intercepting, um, how long will that aircraft be in that specific airspace? So you can see on the right, you have different slices of layers, a different aircraft, and you'll see them. How long are they going to be in that debris hazard area? Larger aircraft, of course, are going to be in more of a, an area based on their size, based on their velocity, based on their altitude. But you then determine this ratio of the volume, uh, the slice of the volume versus the total volume of the airspace. Uh, and that allows us to correct the geometry at each individual altitude band. So this uh, algorithm is currently being used operationally. Um, it's part of uh, the Century Mission Planning Tool, part of PSAP, uh, which is a Pelican Situational Awareness and Planning Tool, um, called Pelican because of how some of these gliding reentry vehicles land. They land like pelicans, if you've ever seen a pelican dive drop straight down and pull up at the last minute. Um, and it is used for existing gliding reentry vehicles. I can't say specifically which one, but if you happen to know of any, I think there's only one. So to handle this Elvis, or, or I'm sorry, to, for Elvis to perform these actions, it's being performed in two different modes. Uh, an a priori mode in advance uh, for mission planning, this is being used by the U.S. Space Force, the U.S. Air Force, NASA, and the FAA, um, and also commercial providers. And it calculates 
these areas based on a known nominal trajectory. To show you a little bit about what that looks like, um, oh, and I apologize, I, I jumped too fast. So this is an image of the, the landing. This is a landing at Vandenberg Air Force Base. I'm sorry, soon to be Vandenberg Space Force Base. Um, creating these, the, the boxes that you see there. The yellow boxes are the aircraft protection boxes. The red on the ground were the uh, ship protection. Another way to look at that is an user initiated. So that's perfect for pre-mission planning if you know the nominal trajectory. But if the vehicle's off nominal, which happens for every single operation, how do you calculate that in real time? This is an image of a real time calculated hazard area by Elvis. Again, the yellow is a volumized aircraft hazard protection area. The red is a ship protection area. It's bounded by four points, mostly due to the, um, the, the lack of modernization of some of the existing systems that exist within the government to handle these information. We can create a much smaller or more dynamically shaped debris area, um, but four points creates a geometric shape easy enough to handle uh, by air traffic control systems. So to show you what that looks like and to handle that, you need to first have situational awareness of where that vehicle is. In this particular image, represented by a C-295 airplane, since uh, we, we weren't allowed to show the actual space plane, you can see that there is a vehicle uh, ahead of the nominal, the no nominal. In the back, there is a slightly opaque nominal projection with the aircraft uh, in actuality, the spacecraft in actuality being slightly ahead of that. And you can see the different hazard areas as they move dynamically through that space, allowing the viewer and the operator to have a real-time situational awareness of where that risk is at any given point. But in the event that you need to create that manually, you can create that point here in this image, and it'll create a new aircraft hazard area based on the current real-time flight dynamics and conditions of that spacecraft. In the event that you lose that spacecraft, you can then generate that hazard area and that debris analysis to determine where that is, resulting in this. That system can then be, that image can then be transported either through KMLs or uh, text, simple text points, or another format to be entered into other systems depending upon where it's in use. So all of this is being done for current government spacecraft. But what it needs to happen is it needs to be either this system or a similar system developed for commercial point-to-point -point transport to become a reality, and also for the pending flight of commercial gliding reentry vehicles. As you can see in the upper right, that is again uh, the Elvis algorithm showing at different bands um, the debris dispersion. And in the bottom right, there's a, a light bulb shaped yellow uh, shape that's kind of undulating, that is the real-time calculated debris footprint for a particular spacecraft as it's landing. Again, showing a four-point uh, cube for airspace or showing a, a more dynamic polygon to show where that debris will be. Taking that real-time debris footprint is one of the next steps for Elvis. It will help to speed up the process. Right now, Elvis takes several minutes to run but that's also about the amount of time it takes for debris to hit the ground coming into orbit, depending on your altitude. So looking at processor optimization, better core utilization for parallelization, um, implementing of texels for uh, faster texture mapping, um, and also being able to do aircraft inference to determine which vectors, which targets are going to be included, those are all the next steps uh, for the Elvis, further Elvis development. And this, in our hope, and in our estimation will help to allow gliding reentry vehicles to have the same benefits and analysis that's being performed on ballistic reentry vehicles. And to help really with the, uh, the airspace integration piece. And eventually, we'll be able to finally get to what my 10 year old dream of life would be like by now, which hasn't happened yet, but I'm hoping we get there soon. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. And um, so Devin gave us a good picture of uh, what the space industry needs to think about when they have objects 
vehicles, people operating below them. Our next presenter is going to present the first of two papers that he has for us on this panel. Sven Kaltenhauser is going to talk about the considerations of things operating above you when you are launching. So welcome, Sven. So, good morning, everybody. Pleasure to be here today. Well, thank you very much for hosting us. Um, yeah, uh, the topic I'm going to present to you uh, today um, is about near-space operations and uh, the way we are going to, uh, let's say, adhere uh, to implement it to act actually as, uh, let's say, a path to integration between air traffic management and space traffic management. So let's figure out how this is working. All right. <clears throat> so when we're talking about near-space, um, actually, what, what is, how it is defined? Um, so usually you can uh, stumble across this, uh, the, the topic we are talking about um, um, airspace in an altitude range between 20 kilometers and roughly about 100 kilometers. As we know, there is no real border of space, the, but we assume that uh, this kind of range can be covered as near space. Um, if you look into literature, you might find other definitions like higher airspace, stratospheric operations, uh, these kind of uh, matters, uh, uh, finally, they, they are addressing this kind of altitude range. And uh, we have different kind of users in this region. Um, so we can distinct between at least three parts. So we have the classical transit users, um, like we are talking about here with getting things up to space. Uh, so we're just crossing through this altitude region. We have some persistent users. I will show you a little bit more about that an increasing range of vehicles which actually want to operate in this altitude range, maybe a little bit more to the lower parts of that, around the 20 kilometer mark, uh, but a significant uh, increasing number uh, of concept is operated there. And then we might have the point-to-point -point users actually, point-to-point -point suborbital flights, hypersonic flights, whatever is going to not reach orbit, but is, uh, let's say, flying from one point to another, um, which also might use this uh, altitude band. Um, just a small collection of, uh, of these three types here in this uh, diagram. Um, I think what really started the discussion about near space is actually what's happening on the, on the uh, left side of this picture with a lot of new concepts on how to actually having some platforms to be stationed in this area. Um, and let's say a vast area of, of airspace which is just really rarely used is now becoming more and more populated, at least concept-wise. I think we are on a on the way to that, uh, you might uh, know the, the loon projects um, and their balloons which are operating altitude bands between 15 kilometers and 20 kilometers. Um, and it's getting more and more of these kind of concepts. So basically we had to start thinking about um, can we just let them fly like they are flying today, so operating themselves, separating themselves by, let's say, their own means uh, which is necessary, or do we have to put uh, into place some um, regulations and also some operational concept. And actually, this is something which is currently taking place, a discussion about uh, setting up a um, concept of operations for higher airspace operations is becoming an in initiative, um, I think, on, on several levels, uh, I think on the CAO level as well as also on the level of the European Commission. And as one of um, the uh, events taking place last year in the European, from, hosted by the European Commission, you could actually, in the, in the minutes, you could see some high-level user requirements for these types of near space operations uh, coming up. So first of all, of course, we have the diversity of operation, which I already introduced you. Then we have the traffic management. So the, uh, the requirement is here to have a scalable approach, emphasis on safe separation, of course, um, and also deconflicting prioritization. So currently, not a lot of um, vehicles operating in that area, but later on there might be concepts actually with operating over certain points of interest. So actually who is going to have the right of way, who is going to have the, the, the way to operate in a, certain, in a certain position, and then combining it with the different kind of users. Um, access, fair and equi equitable access for vehicles to the higher airspace is of course a requirement. Safety has to be ensured, minimize potential impact, um, uh, also interfacing between uh, AT, existing ATM networks uh, and the higher airspace environment. Um, yeah, use of existing framework is possible, so just to adapt your own systems and you don't have to invent the wheel completely new. 
and then also the planning and sharing of information by operators, which actually really has been um, already uh, identified as a top level requirement uh, as part also of also the user community, which I think is a, a good step forward because if that's already recognized by them, that helps actually to realize that. So um, the, the idea behind planning and sharing of information actually is really to provide uh, situation awareness um, for all operators in that area. And um, we can see a little bit more about that in the following slides. So the idea is actually how to, how to organize traffic in that, in that way. So um, the highest priority, of course, is to ensure operation, safe operation at all times. So that means in, in the end that we need a safe separation between all vehicles. And we have to consider the large speed differences from hypersonic speeds up to near static operations. So um, we can consider that tactical control like an air traffic controller is actually controlling um, air traffic uh, by giving, uh, let's say, commands to the aircraft to avoid um, any kind of conflict is uh, becoming very ineffective because you don't have really time and the, the, the objects, the flying objects really cannot uh, react that fast. So that may, means that um, maintaining separation actually becomes strategic, a strategic effort. So how to do that? Um, first of all, plan operations to be conflict free. We have to uh, already address uh, this kind of task very early in the planning process. So we need a conflict-free planning of operation and also considering the different types of operation, long duration over point of interest against short duration, high-speed flights like a, a rocket launch uh, or re-entry operation. So the idea behind the concept we, we have come up with is actually to have kind of a near space operation management. Not really saying that that has to be an institution, but maybe can be a service or maybe can at least be a, a set of management rules which needs to be implemented. So this kind of near space operation management shall provide mission assurance for long-term planning. Um, it is based on a cooperatively managed um, idea uh, and gets augmented by tactical monitoring throughout the flight so that you actually know how um, everything is developing. Um, so to ensure transfers, uh, or it has to also cover um, the uh, insurance that transfers between lower airspaces and actually also flights into orbit are con free of conflicts and there we have the interfaces also to space traffic management and also to the air traffic management. So how to, um, to come up with uh, this kind of strategic separation um, to allocate and actually manage appropriate operating zones is the topic here. So we're actually talking not about 4D trajectories, which is a concept which is well recognized in the air traffic management world, but more like uh, 4D operating zones, um, which are actually covering the uncertainty of the vehicle position over time. So um, you have to deal with, especially on the high altitude platforms, you have to deal with weather, uh, wind events, and um, so the operations actually will, uh, the area of operation will move over time. Um, so actually we recognize a certain operation, operating zone, but this operating zone can actually, let's say, relocate itself um, over time, which means that it's kind of also for in a, dis described in a 4D way. Um, the idea is now to have a planning and monitoring cycle, which actually allows also you to have your 4D operating zone flight plan. Uh, which can be changed during the time of operation because we are talking about 24-7 operations at high, for high altitude platforms. So this is going to be to change if you're changing your, um, let's say, point of interest on that part. Um, and you can actually, this uh, kind of process can be adapted from the um, uh, um, flight management processes for uh, trajectory-based operations. So if you're adapting that, Actually, the question comes up uh, how to, um, let's say, enforce uh, this kind of um, 40 operating zones into uh, the related airspace. And the idea here is actually to adapt certain concepts which are out there um, to then to adapt to the, for, to the near space environment. And one of the um, uh, concepts we could adapt here is a cooperatively managed airspace, which would allow um, the uh, conflict-free route planning and tactical monitoring uh, and builds off a concept of monitoring control exception as it is used in oceanic airspaces, for example. So the idea here is really to, um, to put um, flight data, aircraft traffic information into a shared situation and awareness picture, and then providing these kind of informations to the operators, to the flow management, also to ATC. 
So this is what's been done uh, in this kind of, um, let's say, cooperatively managed airspace nowadays. So if you transfer that to the different altitude regimes, you can actually see that we have different ways of operating and controlling airspace. Um, and this is related a little bit to the altitudes. We have um, the concepts now for, um, let's say, unmanned traffic management for the lower regimes. And if you see the, let's say, the regulatory control that is rather comparatively low, we have um, uh, much more uh, positive control by air traffic control up to the 60,000 feet mark. And then we will start with the cooperatively managed uh, near space until we reach regions uh, which actually uh, are requiring a space traffic management. So in Compress, if you um, look at how conflict avoidance and decision making might happen in these kind of cooperatively managed airspaces, it's actually based uh, not only uh, any longer on an ATC unit who is actually controlling, like this positive control and tactical control, but you have, um, let's say, a set of uh, accepted uh, operational rules and regulations, and then provide situation awareness and decision support, um, and give the vehicle operator sufficient information to avoid collisions by themselves. Um, this also could actually have a, a nice twist over to the spa space traffic management concepts, uh, where we can also discuss about distributed frameworks uh, without actually a sover sovereignty uh, in, in space on that part. Um, so um, another concept which, which comes to hand here actually is um, the uh, flight-centric traffic control, um, which is a concept which has been developed uh, in the recent years, especially for upper airspace control, um, as an alternative to, let's say, controlling typically air traffic uh, um, airspace sectors, where you have, let's say, in a conventional ATC, you have um, an air traffic controller control controlling all tra traffic within one sector under his res responsibility. And the flight-centric traffic control actually changes that by giving the controller the control over certain vehicles in uh, the airspace and communicating with other air traffic controllers and making sure that based on a situation, let's say, of a common situation awareness, you're able to solve conflicts and remain your operations to be conflict-free. The advancement of this is actually that you're much more efficient in, uh, let's say, using your um, human resources for air traffic controllers because we have found out in, in, in a lot of experiments that actually you can handle much more traffic in this kind of setup um, by a, a certain number of air traffic controllers than in the conventional setup. The advancement for us is here that we can actually adapt this concept um, to the strategic separation idea. and see uh, instead of the air traffic controllers, the operators of the vehicles to ensure the conflict-free operations and they are becoming, let's say, responsible for their kind of vehicles in this, in, in a similar approach. Um, now when we're talking about the uh, near space as, as a kind of an airspace uh, and how to address these kind of concepts, uh, another similarity comes to mind, which is um, the idea of the functional airspace blocks which is actually a concept which has been implemented into European airspace a few years ago, uh, which is actually enabling an increased cooperation integration between the different ANSPs in Europe um, and allows a better organization of the airspace and service provision and also drive, is performance driven to meet really the performance requirements from the airspace users. Um, the important features here are that they are these kind of uh, FAPs are con uh, established let's say, regardless of any kind of state boundaries. Uh, it's performance-driven, optimized uh, for the provision of air navigation services. It also already implies civil military coordination. So if we try to adapt this uh, towards our near space operation concept, we could think about, let's say, the near space to be divided in very, very large functional airspace blocks, um, which can also, which would also not be required to, uh, let's say, be bound to any kind of state boundaries. Uh, civil and military coordination could be included and should be included because we will have military users in this kind of region. Um, and we can adapt then the uh, strategic separation with conflict free planning uh, of operations. Um, and the actual planning and monitoring of these operating zones would then be carried out by the near space operation management. So two issues we still need to cover. Um, we need, of course, for the monitoring functions, we need surveillance. Um, and we need surveillance infrastructure and data provision. The idea is here to 
actually, like we said, we want to, this operation to be based on the shared information of the, um, um, of the operators, so we can use their ground um, infrastructures. Um, also use space-based surveying system, like using ADSB functionalities, which can also be derived from space. Um, and then also use the vehicle state data and flight planning information. Put the, all this together, fuse that kind of, these kind of informations, and provide them to all stakeholders, stakeholders in the operation. Actually, we, what, we, what, what our approach is actually to use um, system-wide information management-based services, which is an established sharing of information uh, for the air traffic management world. And uh, there are already structures in there which just needed to be slightly modified to allow us for real-time exchange of these kind of data so that we can achieve, let's say, in a service-based architecture, um, the provision of these kind of services for shared situation awareness. Um, and this directly leads to decision support for operated flights. So these kind of situation awareness ser services uh, could be provided by the near space operation management. Uh, then we have a monitoring of the vehicles along the routes, uh, which ensures uh, the ve vehicles to remain operating free of conflicts through all their phases. Uh, and then we can check against the planning um, support of change requests, like I mentioned before, and have uh, flight centric control by the operators. With all that being said, um, Last issue here, interfacing with stra space traffic management, air traffic management. So we don't want to see near space as an isolated region of, of operation. Um, we, have to, we have to have good interfaces with, let's say, the lower airspace, the airspaces below, because we will have transits. Um, even of the, uh, let's say, permanently operating vehicles, they have to transit through the, the regular airspace up to the near space environment. And we have this kind of interaction for the transit users, because if they, they let's say for launch operators, et cetera, you have to have the, um, uh, let's say, the integration into air traffic management and the, the protection uh, levels in, to be integrated here. So we have to cover the transit between the higher airspace, near space, and the controlled airspace. Um, consider flight planning requirements for both domains, so the flight plans have to be synchronized. Um, we can also use SWIM here uh, for, for helping us and also adapt the data exchange formats which are uh, available here. And for the space traffic management, I think what's very important is that we are not coming up with a system which actually is setting up new boundaries for, let's say, also space operators, um, uh, like uh, said, giving them additional hurdles to fulfill and uh, to get their operations through this kind of um, airspace. Um, so, um, the idea is here really uh, to use the coordinated planning approach, which, is, which has some certain similarities uh, to the approaches we are going to uh, propose for the space traffic management environment. So um, the interface to STM here could be really to ensure that, the, let's say, the trajectory which are planned, which are going to transit into space, are also free of uh, um, any kind of interference with other space objects, so that this kind of, um, let's say, uh, interaction is already integrated. Um, and that, on the other hand, for returning space vehicles, we have an update on position and status information. Um, yeah, on, on time transfer of flight information to be established. Well, um, don't, don't want to, to uh, put the swim flag up to too, too many in this kind of presentation here, but I think it's, it's really an opportunity to use our already established standards and not inventing the wheel again and use what's out there uh, and make that usable for, for us for these kind of concepts. So with that being said, we see the near space as a transition zone between ATM and SDM, and we can also assume or propose that air and space vehicles are both becoming SWIM communicating subsystems in part of the system-wide information management. And that leads me to the summary. Well, major challenge, diversity of operational types, mission profiles. I have presented to you the conceptual approach of strategic separation and cooperative management using a, a near space operation management system, which is augmented by tactical monitoring, um, adopting elements from functional airspace blocks and flight-centric traffic control, um, which makes the operators, or brings the operator in position to be responsible for collision avoidance by themselves, um, and uh, establishing um, very efficient ATM and STM interfaces, which might be swim-based services, and use, let's say, established near space as a transition zone between air traffic management and space traffic management. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, 
Looking forward to your questions later. Thank you, Sven. And our next speaker uh, is going to address a very important issue. Innovative technologies and innovative policies and innovative procedures are limited by our ability to use them. So Carissa Robinson will be addressing ATC human factors issues to minimize airspace disruptions during space vehicle launch and reentry. All right, well, first of all, thank you very much. We, uh, this is our first time participating in this conference, so we we're, uh, we're just wanted to say a big thanks for accepting uh, our, our proposal here because it is a bit different. Uh, I'll just go ahead and, and uh, warn you on that up front. You know, we started with our keynote, you know, way up in space. We've been gradually coming down, and now I'm bringing us all the way back down here as we go through this presentation. Uh, Mosaic ATM. We, we supported the FAA's next-gen office to develop something called the Space Vehicle Operations CONOPS, or SVO CONOPS. And then currently, we are supporting, uh, shepherding through capabilities uh, that are going to enhance ERAM, which is the, the automation system that supports uh, all of the in-route traffic here in the, in the U.S., in the CONUS. And, uh, and hopefully, I'll be able to explain or, or draw your attention to why we've chosen these two topics and these two projects to kind of combine here. So I'm going to start off by walking you through how space vehicle launches are handled today um, in the NAS, and, and Devin kind of provided a bit of a preview, so thanks for that, Devin. That was, that was nice. Then we'll talk through a couple of the concepts from our SVO CONOPS on how we can better manage this going forward. Um, and then, of course, we'll wrap up with some, some research and roadblocks, because unfortunately, whenever there's research, uh, there are also roadblocks. Okay, so... This is a picture, uh, Washington Post did a really great article uh, in 2018 um, about what they called it, gridlock in the sky. So um, this is depicting what happened uh, when a SpaceX Falcon Heavy launched. Uh, you see that yellow box there? That is the airspace that, they, that the FAA closed off. And they, they closed that airspace off for about three hours. That uh, was a special activity airspace. Um, what you can see there is that JetBlue flight was lucky. They got off the ground before that airspace was closed. They were en route from New York to San Juan. Um, so nice direct path there. Uh, Delta was unfortunately caught up in that SAA when that SAA went hot, as we'd say. Um, and you see their flight route that kind of came along the, the eastern seaboard there. That's about an hour extra of flight time there. Uh, obviously, that causes a lot of extra um, money, a lot of extra fuel burn. Airlines are not super excited about this, right? Because then passengers are missing connections, all kinds of things. And Rue Riddle did a study. They estimated that when these big airspaces like this do get closed off, it, it is costing somewhere on the order of, you know, ten to $30,000 a flight. So you guys can all do the math on the number of flights that major carriers operate. This is, this is a huge, huge deal. And this is one example, but of course, as we all know, there were lots more uh, flights in the air that day, right? About 5,000 um, up, up in the sky at any given time. So now we see the impact of, of all these flights, not only in the U.S., but actually also coming over from Europe too, right? That, that SAA, um, Special Activity Airspace, that got shut down went way out into the Atlantic there. So that's impacting flights, um, making it so that you're not flying your most uh, fuel-efficient routes. What you see up in the top there is that although that airspace was closed for three hours, you see when that launch happened about halfway through. Okay, so that whole first hour of that closure, you know, that airspace could have been used, but it was, it, it remained closed for that full three hours. Um, taking just another look, and I know it seems like I'm picking on SpaceX here. Trust me, it's just the, the best pictures that we had were of SpaceX launches. This certainly happens with any space vehicle launch. We get this bottleneck effect, right? So this is from a Falcon 9. Just another view here that, again, that yellow area is what was closed down. Um, and, and you see the impact even when most of the closure is out over the ocean, right? It, it just creates this huge bottleneck coming down the East Coast. And, and I apologize, it's kind of hard to see that that's the East Coast of the U.S., but that's Florida right there. And it's just creating this bottleneck, which, again, like I said, increases Flight time increases delays. A lot of times the FAA is going to handle this by doing something called a ground stop. Um, any of you who have been at the airport on time for a flight, and then all of a sudden your time gets pushed back, you've probably been subjected to a ground stop, even if you don't see any weather in the area where you're at. Now, the FAA obviously is not doing this uh, to cause anyone headaches, to cause uh, you know, the flying public or, 
or airlines headaches, they're doing it for safety, right? And, and the reason they're blocking off these huge pieces of airspace, uh, you know, and again, Devin kind of gave a preview to this, right, is we, we don't know, it's very hard to predict um, where all that debris is gonna go. Uh, if there is a failure, and quite honestly, launch uh, space launches are risky. They're they're a lot more risky um, than than flying airplanes. They do fail a lot, and when they do, it's 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 catastrophic. And one of the the more catastrophic events, I think, from the you know from maybe the last 15 years, um, gave us the the greatest amount of data on this, and that's of course the the Columbia accident. And so we're going to take a look at that and. This one is, is near and dear to my heart. As Ruth mentioned, I did work at Johnson Space Center. I actually was working at Johnson Space Center when this accident occurred. Um, and so that was, uh, that was not, not a very pleasant thing uh, to go through when you work in the same building as, as all the astronauts down there at Johnson Space Center. So taking a look at this, though, um, right prior to this accident, the, the FAA actually didn't really... Uh, do anything, you know, in terms of closing airspace when the shuttle was coming back. Of course, Columbia was supposed to land back in Florida. Um, it started to have problems over the Pacific Ocean, started to, to, to really break up, um, you know, as it, as it crossed into California. And then, you know, this debris field here is, of course, in Texas, right? And, and all of you guys here from, from Texas are, I'm sure, very familiar with this. this. Most of the debris fell kind of south of Dallas here. And on post-analysis that the FAA did, uh, there were actually these flights here. These are all call signs on the, on the right-hand side there. All those flights, actually, commercial flights, traverse that debris field, right, unbeknownst to them. Um, and when they went back and looked at the trajectory of all this debris, the FAA estimated that there was a 1 in 1,000 chance of a commercial flight being impacted that day by debris, which is which is bad enough, but it gets even worse if you, if you look at general aviation. Um, general aviation on that day had a 1 in 100 chance of being hit. And part of that is, is due to the fact that, you know, this debris, some of it was very small, and it stayed up there for a long time. It took 90 minutes, um, approximately, for all this debris to finally reach the ground. And as everybody knows, a small piece of debris uh, on the wrong place of an aircraft is, is obviously a really bad day. Um, so so this, is, this is why so much airspace is closed off, right? Because we're, we're trying to protect and make sure, especially after this event, that, that nothing happens if, if there's a failure on a space vehicle launch, which is fine, and that has worked great um, for the most part, except that there's an increase in space vehicle launches, right? And so um, we can't continue to just shut down huge, huge chunks of airspace for extended periods of time if we're going to, you know, really have commercial space, if we're looking at hundreds of launches a year instead of tens of launches a year, this is not a sustainable solution. So we have to figure out a way to, to work together. And, and that's a lot of what we looked at in the space vehicle um, operations con ops. And two of the ideas that we're going to walk through today is this idea of a just-in-time activation. And what that means is instead of shutting that whole airspace down, you know, for three hours at a time, um, you know, let's just shut it down right before a launch um, and maybe use it as a rolling wave, right? So if, if you know the launch is going to come in, you know, the next 15 minutes, you shut it down. If they miss that launch window and you know it's going to come 15 minutes later, you open it for 15 minutes and then you shut it back down. Um, the other idea here is that maybe we can actually let aircraft operate in this debris hazard area as long as we understand that the air traffic controller in charge of that airspace can safely get all of, the, all of those aircraft out in the event of a failure. And I'll, I'll just be real honest, that's definitely a less popular idea, especially, right, I flew down here uh, from Colorado, and even for me, that's, that's, that's a little bit of a less popular I idea. But, right, as, as space vehicles get more and more uh, reliable, and as we launch more and more of them, this is maybe something that we can consider moving towards. And certainly we need lots of different, we need somewhere in between probably of both of these. But let's take a look at a couple pictures to see how this would work. Um, so again, this is, this is where you just shut the airspace down. So, so these aircraft that are flying through this airspace are not exposed 
to any debris. We've got two aircraft here, the green um, aircraft kind of north to south there, and then the red one sort of southwest to northeast. And so assuming that we get to a point where, where launches are a bit more reliable, where the timing of launches are a bit more reliable, which, which they also aren't um, as much today, you could, uh, you know, kind of preemptively activate this airspace. Um, the controller would take a look and go, okay, well, it, in the next 15 minutes, there's going to be a space launch, but that green aircraft can, can traverse safely, uh, but the red one can't. So if that area goes hot or if it becomes active, we've got to do something about that red aircraft. So sure enough, the space launch happens in that next, um, next bubble down there where it's red. We're going to go ahead. You know, the, the green aircraft is, is already free and clear. No, no issue. No, no route change there. The red aircraft, we're going to vector them off around that hazard area. And as soon as that space vehicle is clear, which, of course, on a launch, right, we're only talking about, you know, five, on the order of five to ten minutes that, that these space vehicles are in controlled airspace, right? They're, they're not hanging out for a long time. Um, so we can vector that guy back onto his route, and that's maybe like a five-minute delay, um, you could even, you know, consider a holding pattern or those types of things as well, as opposed to what, what I showed in that Falcon Heavy, you've got to just route all the way around. Everybody's got to route all the way around. Um, and so this, this really works pretty well for, uh, for, for launch. But when we talk about reentry, right, and gliding vehicles that are going to come down, they're going to cover a lot more airspace, this maybe gets a little bit more tricky. And so this is this is the second part of the concept where we actually allow air traffic to operate in this gray region. So just to, to set ourselves here, the, the black line there is that space vehicle trajectory. The red around there is the uncertainty in the trajectory because, of course, you know, we, we never can predict it exactly. And then, then the yellow indicates you know, the, the separation that you would want to keep from that, from that airspace vehicle. And, you know, in, in the NAS today, it's five nautical miles separation between aircraft, right? And this will probably be some kind of time-based separation in terms of how far away you want to keep, keep other airplanes um, or other vehicles. The gray, bo the gray region there is, is um, the area the, of debris hazard, potential debris hazard. And you see it goes kind of up above and back below underneath where that, that um, space vehicle is coming back in. And this, this really becomes more important, too, because, you know, in the future, we're not going to just be launching from the coasts, right? Uh, Blue Origin launches out of West Texas, and uh, Colorado actually does have a spaceport that has been approved by the FAA, certified by the FAA. It's located six miles off the end of uh, the runways at DIA. So you can't just shut everything down when somebody wants to land at one of these spaceports that's in the middle of the country. You'd be shutting down a huge, huge amount of airspace. But, like I said, that's sort of a tough pill to swallow, uh, especially since most of us flew here. Um, one of the, uh, on the space vehicle ops, con ops, we worked with a company out of, out of California. They did some analysis here on, on predicting the trajectories of, of, a, of a catastrophic event. This is actually a a structural failure um, on a launch, and you see it, it's over here on the left-hand side. We've got altitude on the right. And what this is showing is that, you know, if we could move aircraft, right, because our aircraft operate under, under 50,000 feet, right? So if we can safely maneuver, if we felt that we could safely maneuver aircraft out of that debris field in, let's say, eight minutes, well, then, then we've avoided, actually, a, a big chunk of, of the debris hazard here. So... What that would look like is something like this. You would still activate that, that airspace, right? You would still let people know and you would let airlines know that this, is, that this area is going to be hot uh, because airlines could also opt to not fly through that. They could opt to not take that, that risk, um, and, and that would be their, their choice, certainly. And so you might have to limit the number of aircraft that are actually allowed to operate in this airspace, so that the controller could actively take control of these aircraft to vector them out or to avoid the airspace um, altogether, if, if, that was, if that was the case. So this requires a really huge paradigm shift if we're going to move to this more um, dynamic control of, of handling space vehicle operations. Because right now, complexity, at least in the, in the NAS, in the National Airspace System, is really handled very, um, very statically. And by that, what I mean is 
there's a lot of routing, routing in place, there's a lot of procedures in place, there's metering, there's plans that are set up at, at 5 a.m. in the morning that are going to be in effect for the whole day to manage air traffic. Well, if we're going to be reactive to space vehicle operations and we're talking about changing and issuing this data um, on which airspace is to close in a very dynamic manner, not only does that require changes to automation systems, which I'll, which I'll get to in a minute, but it really causes a, ch a change in how we handle and manage the airspace. And, um, and that, is, that is really can be a very tough thing um, to sell, not only to the flying public, but to air traffic controllers as well. This idea that we're going to move and be more dynamic. Um, because that's really what's required if we're going to move to this model and support more space vehicle launches. Some of the f human factors oriented research, like I said, um, that's required a really big shift for controllers is that they do have conflict detection right now, airspace to airspace or aircraft to aircraft and aircraft to airspace, excuse me, but they have no conflict resolution um, that's provided to them through automation. So what that means is if a controller sees an alert on their scope between two aircraft, it is totally up to that controller to, to figure out how to avoid that conflict. Okay, so they might issue, um, you know, one aircraft to climb, one aircraft to descend, they might issue a vector to an aircraft, but the automation ERAM does not provide them with any options. It just says there's going to be a problem, you better fix it. And as it gets closer and closer to being a problem, the warnings get louder and louder. When we're talking about the potential debris field um, created by space vehicles, you can't manage that without some type of automated conflict resolution provided. A controller cannot be expected to sit and think and predict in their head where all this debris is going to go and how to maneuver the aircraft. And although it sounds to us, you know, all of us research folks here in the room, like that's a really obvious thing. Why wouldn't you just do that in automation? Um, let me tell you, that is a, that's a hard thing to sell to an air traffic controller um, because that is, that is their job and that's what they're used to doing. And they're used to having that level of positive control over aircraft that are flying so that is a huge paradigm shift um, for the air traffic control community here. Um, like I mentioned, airlines may decide that they don't want to take the risk, that they don't want to fly through these, these airspace, you know, when space vehicle launches are happening. And, and that, that could certainly be something that's, you know, that's part of the concept that, that you're allowed to opt out. Or do you prioritize aircraft, right? Maybe you don't allow GA flights into those regions when there's a launch. Maybe you do allow commercial. Maybe vice versa. Um, you know, depends on depends on how how this all works out. How do you communicate all of this, right? Especially if we're talking about moving to more of a, a real time um, situation. Certainly, right now, majority of the communication between the pilot and the ground is all done via voice. Uh, we're gradually moving towards datacom. Um, and, and towards more electronic forms of communication. But what you have to remember is that air traffic management and airspace management is definitely uh, less sophisticated than, than space um, technologies, right? So even though maybe space technologies are antiquated, um, you know, in some areas, the stuff that we use is definitely a lot, um, you know, it, it's, it's tried and true and tested, and there's not a lot of new technologies out there. Although we did get ADSB on January 1st of this year, so, woo! Um, Controller acceptability, <laughs> yeah, that was a long time coming. Public passenger acceptability, I, I had a rough ride into Austin last night, um, and the lady sitting next to me actually was a, was a terrified passenger. Um, she was a very nervous flyer. She actually apologized when I sat down before the flight even took off. She warned me, and we, got, we hit a couple real good bumps coming in, and she, she screamed and she started crying. Um, imagine that same woman on a flight when she looks out her window and there's a launch. Um, you know, these are things we have to, uh, you know, we have to consider the human factors part of this is, is, is you know, I mean, I'm, I'm being a little tongue in cheek here, but it, it is a real, it's, it's a real concern, right? Because again, the public is very unaware um, of these types of things that we, we research and we look at, um, but they are the ones who pay to be on these flights. And, and so, you know, you have to, you have to take that in, into consideration. And I'll leave you with this parting thought. So, um, the automation systems that support all this uh, in, the, in the U.S., there is a process for up, 
upgrading them. Okay, and there's two ways you can go about that process. You know, there's either a sustainability um, track that you can use, and that's typically to fix, you know, um, bugs in the software, upgrade hardware, th those types of things, or there's an enhancement track. And right now, I'm the PM for the next round of, of enhancements going into the ERAM automation system. Most of those enhancements and those capabilities that we're bringing in started development probably around, you know, 2010, 2012. Um, they are going through the FAA's acquisition process right now. That's, that's our job is to shepherd those through um, so that then they can, they can go out uh, as part of a contract. They're expected to be in the field in 2028. So these concepts, most of them started in 2012, um, give, assuming there's no changes in FAA budget or, or no, um, no shift in schedule, those capabilities, we can expect them in 2028. Um, so if we want to get these types of concepts into our existing automation systems. We have to do the research like yesterday. We, we, you know, because they're about to lock in then the enhancements that'll go in in 2032. It's about a four year cycle. Um, so, and I can tell you right now, uh, I would not take any more capabilities onto that package that's going in 2028. In fact, a lot of the capabilities will probably end up being dropped. Um, so if we're talking about any, anything that I just mentioned, getting into just, just the en route automation system, and this isn't even talking about the oceanic um, or even impacts to the, to the terminal area systems, uh, you know, the, the window is, is closing to, to get those enhancements in because it is, it is a pretty big process. So uh, I'll leave you with, with that uh, parting thought on reality of where we're at. All the research is great, but... Uh, you know, you, you got to get it into the real system um, if you want to if you want to see any change. Thank you, Teresa. I want to especially thank you for that presentation because if you remember that image of all those airplanes compressed along the east coast of Florida, that was the airspace I worked for 25 years as an air traffic controller. So I felt the pain of every launch in that period. Moving on to our final presenter, who is someone you are already familiar with, is uh, Sven Kaltenhauser is going to talk about the modeling and simulation of suborbital flight profiles in the determining of airspace restrictions, which is an innovative new field when we talk about suborbitals and an opportunity to do that research early that Carissa mentioned. Thank you, Ruth. So hello, it's me again. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm holding this presentation on behalf of uh, my colleague Lisa Tetsche. Um, she actually performed this research study, uh, probably sitting at home currently watching the live stream, so hello from that point of view. Um, yeah, um, what I wanted to introduce you is uh, to um, how we performed the study uh, with regard to uh, what kind of impact, air traffic impact would we foresee if we put up uh, suborbital operations, let's say in Europe, in this specific uh, case, uh, in the area of northern Germany something which we want to figure out uh, how realistic it is to perform such kind of operations there. So we'll guide you quickly through the motivation methodology, the hazard area calculation, mission trajectory determination, and then the imp traffic impact modeling, uh, and a little bit about the traffic optimization and some conclusions. So what is the motivation? Of course, we have, well, let's say, two conflicting uh, uh, things taking place. On the one hand, we have an, a traffic development in Europe, which is still covered by some increased scenarios, of course, with all the discussion about, um, uh, let's say, climate-optimized flying, reducing pollution, CO2 emissions. These kind of forecasts may also vary a little bit, depending on the scenario you're looking at. On the other hand, we have, uh, let's say, our old concept about commercial space, suborbital space. Uh, we, did, we performed some uh, initial use cases uh, about how point-to-point uh, -point hypersonic traffic would look like, intercontinental traffic. Uh, using uh, the uh, developed um, space liner concept within DLR. Uh, but you also have, let's say, classical suborbital flight concepts, uh, A to A flights. Um, and this is uh, the one we wanted to have a look at uh, uh, this use case here. Um, so the objective uh, of, of the research study here was an optimization of a suborbital space plane trajectory to minimize the traffic impact for an application scenario in Europe. This application scenario is northern Germany. Um, so uh, the research question here were to develop a simulation model first of all, uh, to calculate the space plane trajectory for ourselves, uh, calculating then the hazard areas and configuration of the mission trajectory, 
uh, for the northern German spaceport and then optimizing space plane mission trajectory to minimize the air traffic impact. Um, for the modeling, actually, so what kind of space plane should we take? Well, okay, let's see what's out there. Spaceship 2 was, let's say, a good example for that. You know, the flight phases, I think you're familiar with that. So we have an air launch about, at about 50,000 feet, rocket propelled climb, parabolic flight, then uh, the re-entry and an unpowered glide. The unpowered glide, of course, is very is important as it also determines the range of, on, from, from the space spot actually where we want to land uh, and how far we can put this uh, flight let's say, away from the spaceport. So um, there are some assumptions going into the model, of course, and um, we're not uh, having uh, the, let's say, the real data of a Spaceship 2 uh, space plane available, and we wanted to make it more generic, so we said, okay, let's see what we can find out there as parameters and trying to get a realistic uh, calculation and, and a simulation model for such a space plane uh, into our MATLAB environment. So uh, this is the result of the, um, of the uh, simula let's say, of the modeling and simulation phase. Uh, with this model, we could achieve a maximum uh, altitude of 105 kilometers uh, for a flight duration time of 80 minutes and a range of 129 kilometers. Uh, maximum speed is Mach 3.5. And you have, can see the five phases here in the um, MATLAB model and the calculation of the, uh, of the trajectory here uh, in three-dimensional space. Um, so with this uh, kind of um, trajectory, we found it quite realistic to the kind of information we found for a Spaceship 2 trajectory. Um, we wanted to figure out how, f how big the hazard area has to, has to be, um, which is actually the, I mean, we, we heard a lot about hazard areas in the previous uh, presentation, so I don't have to go into much more detail here. Um, so what we actually did uh, was to, uh, to use a provisional hazard area model we have in-house, which is a very simple one, um, apply it to the trajectory, uh, do some acceptable risk level calculation with the three sigma uh, calculation method, uh, and then con did a comparison with other scenarios. And uh, these kind of other scenarios were, uh, for example, the uh, data we found for, the, uh, for, for SS2 flights uh, planned for a Cecil uh, space, Air and Space Port in the U.S., and also some information we took out of the uh, SS2 accident, uh, flight accident report uh, for, the Moha for uh, the flight in Mojave. Uh, and at the end, we come out here with, uh, let's say, roughly, uh, let's say, the estimates of uh, a hazard area uh, and flight protection area, which covers, let's say, the suborbital flight phase and the um, transfer flight back to the spaceport. Uh, and if you, let's say, adapt these kind of information, which is an overlay of data we found, um, you can, can come up with, uh, let's say, a more simplified schematic of the hazard area related to this kind of trajectory. Uh, let's say, distinguished in two parts. You have the suborbital uh, um, flight paths leading up to uh, the 105 kilometers, and then the return phase and the flyback to the spaceport. Uh, roughly divided here in blocks uh, 70 kilometers uh, by 60 kilometers um, and uh, the transfer flight uh, for 50, 60 kilometers uh, length and 22 kilometers wide. In the first assumption we said, okay, every, every part of this uh, hazard area is about up to unlimited uh, altitudes um, and we have a time slot for the whole flight of uh, 30 minutes and the hazard areas to be active through, whole, through the whole flight. So that was the basic assumption. We then uh, put this uh, framework into, um, let's say, the airspace. Uh, this is um, the northern German airspace around uh, the uh, airport of Rostock Lage. Um, some conditions we wanted to adapt, local airspace structure, of course, there are certain uh, restricted and danger areas already in place. Uh, we assume a daylight flight. Uh, we have to, comp uh, to take into account the limited range. Uh, and, of course, have to um, address uh, safety and noise issues, which led us, of course, to have the suborbital flight phase to take place over water. Um, you can uh, barely see the, um, let's say, the coastal line of, of uh, the eastern part of northern Germany uh, around the Rostock Lager Airport there. And in blue, you can see the um, uh, possible military flight restriction areas which can be put into place if needed. So we did an air traffic impact, uh, the traffic impact modeling using the AirTrop simulation software um, uh, based on uh, some Euro control data for the, for the airspaces around that. 
Uh, we used the reference day, 7th April of 2050, about 8,000 flights in this uh, traffic scenario. And there are, it's, let's say it's kind of a typical flight day uh, over Europe. Uh, and we wanted to figure out, let's say, the, the number of flights which, which somehow interact with these hazard areas which I have depicted you, which are uh, drawn there in the, in the lower right corner. Um, and you can see the color code uh, for those two options of hazard areas, one from, uh, let's say, more from the uh, western side, western northern side, and the other one from the eastern uh, northern area to fly into uh, the spaceport. Uh, and the total number of affected flights for the hazard areas were 156 compared to hazard area 2, 103. But you can already see that there are a certain time, let's say in, in the time period between 9 o'clock and 6 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you have certain periods, especially for the hazard area number 2, where you have really a very low number of interactions, like just four flights. And interaction means really that there could be a flight which is just, just barely uh, touching one of those zones. So we want to figure out... Um, with, for the, especially for the hazard area number two uh, option to optimize it to fit into the restriction, uh, the airspace re restriction areas which are already in place. Um, and optimizing that a little bit for that, so that's how it could look like. We did a recalculation um, for this kind of adapted uh, features. We have now a, a combined um, interaction of 132 flights, but we thought, well, uh, let's put some optimization into place about uh, the position and also um, the airspace structure here, um, and then um, trying to reduce uh, the, uh, let's say, the vertical altitudes of uh, the protection area for the, uh, especially for the transfer phase, um, and uh, therefore, let's say, limiting a little bit the, uh, or distinguishing this, this part of the hazard area into several blocks with uh, shrinking altitudes which was then giving us an opportunity uh, or the, the ability to reduce the number of uh, flights which are interacting with. And we have uh, some off-peak hours between 11.30 and 13.00, uh, which we can use uh, for these kind of flights with an interaction of about, like I said, two to four flights, uh, which then would have to be rerouted to uh, avoid these kind of areas. So that was the first uh, calculation of uh, these kind of uh, implementations into, let's say, let's say, kind of a busy airspace uh, and see if that's a possibility actually to do. Um, so, of course, um, let's say with the MATLAB model we have in place and uh, let's say the very, just the still to be optimized methods for determining the hazard areas, we can already uh, giving some first indications about how these kind of operations would interfere and interact with air traffic in, in this uh, traffic scenario. Um, we would, let's say, in future cons consider also um, the effects on, let's say, the ship shipping traffic in this region uh, and also optimizing the model and especially optimizing also um, the way we would implement these kind of hazard areas there. So some of the topics we already heard about, and uh, this concludes, let's say, this part of the presentation. So thank you very much. So we do have time for questions, and I'm going to indulge as the moderator to start with my own. When we talk about the hazard areas and the impact to other aircraft, all of the assumptions uh, are based on the fact that we expect the rocket to explode that there will be a catastrophic loss on every single flight. We don't have that assumption in other modes. We certainly don't have it in aviation. If every flight was expected to be a crash, then we'd have a very different model. So we've been launching things into space for more than 60 years. We've been doing it commercially for 35. Is there a target level of safety that we can achieve that would allow us to assume that a mission will be safe and successful and not have to have these large hazard areas and model for the potential debris? And I'll ask each one of you. Uh, so to, to go first, um, I, I believe that there is actually a standard out there. I, I, I don't recall. There's a certain number, based on the number of flights for a specific vehicle or the family of vehicle, um, to determine uh, the level of failure or the failure rate uh, potential for that vehicle. The problem is that uh, all of these commercial companies coming in developing new vehicles or, to, to be polite, constantly refining their vehicles um, like as in, as in probably the most prolific commercial launcher is constantly refining their own vehicle, they're constantly resetting that clock and that count for their vehicle. So despite the fact they've had, you know, what I think 30 successful launches of a Falcon 9, um, the significant changes and revisions to that vehicle 
have constantly reset that clock. Um, other vehicles like the Delta Does it go II, back to zero? Uh, it, it goes back to, to near zero, yes. If it, I, I would assume so. I'm not, I can't speak completely, but I believe that it does, that it re completely resets. Um, vehicles like the Delta II that had you know 130 plus successful flights, um, their failure rope rates uh, drop considerably. There is a, uh, I believe in 417, uh, the CFR 417, there's a um, affectionately called a Christmas tree diagram that kind of shows the failure rates based on the number of flights and things like that. So have we had a policy change that incorporates the thought that this is a low failure rocket so we can close less airspace? Th there is a, a notice to propose rulemaking that, uh, that could possibly change that, but there was a, quite a bit of, of uh, input from the community, um, and, uh, and I have not yet seen the revision. So uh, yes, I believe that there's an attempt to, but I'm, I haven't seen it yet. Can you give us a European perspective? Oh, yes. Um, on that part, it's, um, let's say the, uh, there's really an increased amount of, of discussion going on in that regard, especially when we are considering uh, the topics for regulations for suborbital flights. So there are some <laughs> initiatives taking place in, in Europe currently to, to come up with some regulations there, and especially um, the accept acceptable uh, level of, of, of failure is, is, is um, is one of the issues when we are discussing in, in, in that regard for the working groups about, um, well, when, when is it safe to have passengers on board? So it, the discussion is a little bit different in, in Europe than in the US maybe, so there is, the, the, let's say, the ideas there are still settling. Uh, but I think uh, for these kind of suborbital flights, uh, as an example, Spaceship 2, but also other, others might occur, um, the target level here is would be 10 to the minus 4. Um, as as we have in, in general aviation, some, somehow in comparison to that, that's except. Uh, I think this is discussion is going on with respect to the passenger safety side, but I think it would also change the way how we, how we would actually have to consider that for air traffic control and for for this kind of protection area. So that might actually work to the benefit. For let's say classical vertical rockets, I'm, I think you just mentioned that that that's very very difficult to to figure out uh, with the uh, number of launches. Uh, the number of flights for uh, suborbital uh, spacecraft could, uh, let's say, increase much. If, if they are successful, then that could increase much, much faster, and that that might actually drive be a driver also to come to, uh, let's say, better understanding of, of higher levels of, of safety there. Carissa, can you add to that? Yeah, no, I was just I was trying to think of, of what to add here to to what they've both already said, and I guess what what I'd think about is the fact that. Um, Although we've all gotten very used to, to air traffic um, and air travel being very safe, right, it only took um, two accidents of the 737 MAX for that plane to be grounded. Um, and, you know, I mean, essentially, it's, it's right, nobody's flying it, it's a huge deal. And that only took two, two accidents. And, and so when we talk about these space launches, although we've been doing them for, for a long time, you know, um, they just don't have the, the numbers yet, I'm afraid, to, to be able to give anybody any level of confidence um, in, their, in their success rate, right? When we think about, you know, 5,000 flights above us right now, you know, I mean, just the number of operations um, that, that we get from, from planes gives us such a, a higher level of confidence that they're not going to explode. And, you know, there is certainly, there's certainly an assumed risk, right? I mean, that, you know, all, all airspace operators take an assumed risk, right? Something can go wrong. Um, it's just that it usually doesn't. And so there's just, it's just so much more data, unfortunately. It's going to take us a while to get there, I think. Um, you know, I mean, even the shuttle, right, 136 launches and two failures, right? So that, I mean, that's huge. That's, that's a, such a much um, worse record than, than a 787 or a 767. So it's just really hard. It's gonna take a while. All right, well, questions from the audience? Yes, Mark. Hi, nice talks. Um, Mark Skinner, Aerospace Corporation. Uh, I'd be interested to find out if you have any opinions on techniques and technologies that might be useful for launches through the national airspace um, that might allow uh, minimizing the, the hazard area volume, uh, specifically things like um, uh, requiring telemetry streams near real time, um, overhead persistent infrared, observations of, of launch trajectories, uh, radar corridors, ADSB kinds of things. Uh, what, what, I'd like to hear the panel's uh, thoughts on that. So let's start with you. 
All right, sounds good. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's actually a really good question. Um, I know that they have conducted some experiments with putting ADS-B sensors uh, you know, on, onto the bodies of, of these rockets. They're, they're very inexpensive, and so um, I think, uh, you know, they've, they've definitely done some experiments with that. I think, uh, I don't remember which company participated, but the FAA has done that. The question is just, you know, how many sensors do you, you know, do, do you put on because it only helps you if it doesn't break up. If it breaks up, then you, you know, then you need thousands of these sensors potentially, right? Where do you put them? Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, the, there, there has been some work at least sponsored by, by NASA and the FAA on, on uh, being able to stream ADSB data for, for launches anyway. <clears throat> yeah, that's um, exactly also the information I got from, from that. So it would be, we consider also the, the, the real-time um, distribution of data as very essential for that. So the, the, let's say the more um, precisely we can determine, let's say, not only the flight trajectory, but also the, the, the point where, the, where a possible breakup occurs, gives us a tremendous advantage in shrinking, let's say, the level of, of uncertainty of actually where the debris generating event took place. So th there might be some, I heard also some concepts where you, where you might have a specific, very um, hard, hard proofed um, um, sensor, a position sensor, which also can, uh, let's say, distribute a positioning signal, like an ADSB signal, but in a, in a different, different kind of container, which would at, at least be a reference during, let's say, the re-entry or the, the distribution then of, uh, of particles. Um, I think it's essential to have these kind of, of information to be real-time uh, available, as we are currently, I might say, also, let's say, DLR is work, working together with FAA, AST, on, let's say, on a concept and a demonstration of how to, let's say, exchange data real time during launch events uh, to, between ANSP, also on, on different sides of the Atlantic uh, in this, this respect, between the US and Europe. And especially there we can, let's say, we are assuming that we have these kind of real time information available and then use methods on relaying these kind of information through all the stakeholder levels. Yeah, Larry Martinez at California State University at Long Beach. Uh, very interesting panel, especially uh, talking about the uh, Falcon Heavy launch and the diversion of the Delta Airlines flight uh, from San Juan up to, I believe, New York. Uh, as a political science uh, person, uh, we look at burden sharing and how might burden sharing and whether or not Delta Airlines could send a, a bill to Elon uh, for the one-hour diversion and the additional costs that the airline uh, incurred because of the uh, launch schedule of another commercial entity, which is SpaceX. And so I was wondering, what about burden sharing, and how might mechanisms for burden sharing affect the technical solution to these problems? Devin, you look eager to answer that one. <laughs> so... Uh, with, with regard to the, the, the hazard area generation, I'll kind of answer Mark's uh, question as well, kind of a little bit with this. Um, the, the 45th Space Wing specifically, the U.S. Space Force, in more broad terms, have really been working to reduce what they consider to be what they call the destruct lines. So for at least the students in the room, if no one else is, is familiar, uh, hopefully I, I, I teach you something new. When you look at a, a vertical launcher, you look at the point at which the majority of the impact will hit, the leading point of where that debris is going to hit. And that's actually the point at which you care about. Um, it's great to know that the vehicle's up above 60,000 feet. You really want to know where it's going to impact the ground and, and cause an impact to anybody else. Um, having, in the past, they've had these massive destruct lines based on all the possible turn ratios that could happen uh, from analysis that was done using some older antiquated or, or really brute force statistical methods. And they've been working in the last couple of years, especially with the number of launches, to reduce that to only what is physically possible. So if the vehicle turns based on the vehicle, it'll break up. Some of these turns are simply just not physically possible, which has helped to reduce that hazard area side to help reduce the impact to commercial aircraft as well as a benefit. Now, that determination of that size is really handled by the range in coordination with the FAA for commercial launch operations but it's really based on the experience of the federal range conducting that operation. So uh, as much as I'd, I'd love to blame Elon for all kinds of things in my own mind, uh, I, I don't necessarily know that that was his fault, 
nor do I really know that the impact to Delta and JetBlue, and I know that they're going to get super mad at me in my next conference I see them both at, I don't really know that the impact was that significant compared to all the times that I've been stuck for weather or maintenance or pilots not showing up. That's happened to me a couple times. Uh, that, that impact of that single launch is absolutely minuscule compared to all of the other uh, disruptions to air travel that exist. Um, there are some numbers that have been, have been mentioned by the FAA as far as what that impact really is. As far as burdening, um, yes, it is difficult for the federal government to favor one commercial entity over another. I think that's still a discussion that needs to happen. Uh, but really what it comes going to come down to is, is uh, sharing of risk, not sharing of, of cost burden. But the sharing of risk of putting your passengers at risk or your operation at risk, um, that's really where it needs to come in. Um, there needs to be less space as a disruptor of the NAS and more space as a participant in the NAS. And I think that's where, at least within the last uh, couple of years, that, that cooperation I've seen really grow. Once airlines started to understand that, that uh, space operations have, have a completely different methodology, that you can't just launch at a specific time. It depends on where you're going, where you're trying to deliver your orbit. Um, you have very specific launch windows for very specific reasons based on physics and science and not simply based on Elon's whim. Um, granted, he did put a car into space on a whim, but, but that's, a, that's a whole different question that I'm not going to answer. He is launching anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> George. George Neal, Commercial Space Technologies, LLC. Some great presentations. Thank you. Uh, Chris, I was particularly intrigued by your comments about how long the development and approval process is for evolutions in our current systems. And it occurs to me that other high-tech industries today don't have those same time frames. If you think about um, autonomous cars, drones, the iPhone did not exist until 2007. So as a thought experiment, if we were to put some smart people in a room with a clean sheet of paper and say, what would the NAS aviation management system look like given today's technology that didn't necessarily rely on the people who are working hard and trying their best to keep people safe, would that be an interesting thought experiment? Change, you mean, as opposed yes. to like trying to, to upgrade? Yeah, it's, and, and you do it in parallel right, until right. you're ready, but at, at some right, point, maybe that's something to over. think about. Yeah, it is. You know, it's interesting. I actually uh, get into this um, debate with a colleague of mine all the time. He's, he's a retired air traffic controller, and, and, and he has these. Um, out of wash center and so he has all these great ideas and he's like well why can't we just why can't like I don't understand why can't we just get this in and and I have to keep reminding him and he'll use the iPhone example also he he's like they they come out with new ones all the time this is I said yes but if your if your iPhone fails you don't die um, you know I mean you might feel like you're dying on the inside if you haven't backed <laughs> up to the cloud but but in general you know you're you're you know, you're you're just you're just minorly disrupted for the day. Whereas, you know, I mean, ERAM is this is this you know massive system that's that's countrywide, and and part of part of the reason it takes so long to get changes in is because um, you know even though we're we're trying to push through capabilities that that we think as researchers um, make a lot of sense. You know, you you put it um, in front of of the stakeholders, which include, you know, pilots and, and air traffic controllers, and they go, "You're nuts. Uh, we're, we we don't want the automation to do this. That that doesn't make any sense." And so, so you know, as much as I'd like to blame it on on government um, bureaucracy, and that's certainly a part of it, it. That isn't all of it. A lot of this process is so that you end up um, with a you know with a system that still has this very high reliability. Um, you know that can be operated uh, by the existing workforce, and so that's you know I mean that's that's part of the reason um, taking a wholesale like redesign approach. I mean that's yeah. I mean I don't 
I'm, I'm just going to go out on a whim and say I don't think the FAA would be super excited about that. Um, but you know, at the same time, at the same time, I mean, you're, you have a you have a valid point. It is, it is very difficult. Um, you know, these systems uh, have been in place for a while, and ERAM is actually the enhanced system. Right? I mean, it's actually relatively new, um, and even still, yeah, it, it takes a while to get to get things updated. So maybe you can uh, maybe you can can find a, an SBIR topic or something to write to for that one. That, that would, NASA, I would think, would jump all over that, not the FAA, probably. Just, just, just a quick remark on that. I think you, you currently can, can watch actually such a, a system being designed from the scratch. And it's, it's, it's taking place for, before our eyes, which is actually what's happening in the unmanned traffic management. So there, there people started to, to think from scratch from a white uh, sheet of paper and, and trying to figure out how to have a highly automated system with, with so many actors, uh, with high, high speed uh, information sharing, a very cooperative, uh, but also secure and safe uh, to be coming in place. And actually, there is a lot of discussion going on as if this is kind of the blueprint of what's going to happen. And, let's say, real uh, air traffic control and air traffic management. The, prob the problem is really the transition, right? So you have so many actors, so many participants who have the right to participate in air traffic, who have the right to enter airspace, um, which are, let's say, operating vehicles which are, let's say, from, from their equipment not able to transfer to a completely new system at once. And as, as soon as you have a system where you have to rely on every vehicle being equipped with certain kind of technologies, then we have this kind of roadblocks in our way. So it's, this is one of the big challenges we are facing here. We have time for one more question. So who's our lucky questioner? If, if not, then I'll, I'll uh, add, add real quick to Dr. Neal's point. Um, we have time for one more answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is uh, being able to, uh, there's going to have to be a necessity to, to, to make ERAM or make the NAS systems go faster. They're, the commercial space industry is moving at such a speed that it's going to be faster than the FAA can adopt new systems. The same was true for the Space Force. GPS came online in 2011. I was helpful to do that. I, I, well, I used to tell people we, we, we brought the range kicking and screaming into the 1990s. It, 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 it just takes anything. The only thing fast in the space industry is the rocket until commercial space came along. With the introduction of autonomous flight safety systems, we suddenly reduced massively the amount of infrastructure needed to handle those systems. And that same thing is going to have to happen again to the NAS, whether people want to realize it, uh, the, the controllers specifically, and, and know if all, all of my friends that are controllers, I, I think understand that simply because the workforce is so low. There's just not enough controllers, and, and they're not having plans to really make those numbers. There's going to have to be a change, and it is likely going to have to be from the commercial industry, whether it's the commercial airline industry or the commercial space industry or both, uh, and quite frankly, the political willpower to do it, which I, I don't yet see, so. Well, considering political willpower, we are exactly on time, and I would like to ask the organizers if you need a podium before the break, or do you want me to send everyone on their way? So enjoy the break. Uh, the schedule is very clearly printed, so we will return at 11.30 for the next panel. Thank you very much.